And now since Pastor Allen is not up here, I'm going to go ahead and preach the message. <laughs> I think we have a video next. It's easy to think the world is a safe place for Christians, since that's the experience in the West. But Jesus warned us quite clearly that the world would be a very dangerous place for those who truly follow him. When we started persecution.org, we knew there was more to the epidemic of persecution than the little you could find in the press, statistics, or dusty books. And so we started out on a journey to discover the truth about persecution and bring that truth to the world. We were determined to be a witness, an advocate, and a champion for the suffering church of Jesus, meeting their needs, whatever they might be. In the years of this journey, we've reported on stories more brutal than we could have imagined. And we've heard stories that shook us to our soul. And we've had to say goodbye to too many friends that we thought would always be with us. In the beginning of the journey, we were surrounded by despair for the job turned out to be massive. But at some point along the way, as we built our ability to serve, fight for, and rescue the persecuted, hope began to shine through. Jesus promised us that if we loved him, the world would hate us. In other words, we can't stop persecution, but we can build and bandage the church where Jesus' followers are hated, attacked, and their lives are taken from them. We can take the message of Jesus into the most dangerous places in the world and see those who hate Christians turn to Jesus and become a new creation. One candle lights another, and the body of Jesus grows, and hate dies. This is the great secret of persecution, and why they say persecution is the seed of the church. Looking on the persecuted, the world sees the scum of the earth. We see the body of Jesus that's being tortured and raped and imprisoned and killed. Our journey has shown us that though the persecuted church may be in rags, it is in reality the true bride of Jesus, pure, undefiled, willing to die rather than to be apart from the love of her life. This church is made up of millions of believers and it shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. This is the Persecuted Church, and we are persecution.org. After being told what to do a hundred different times, <laughs> and, and in his defense, I told him three times. I just <laughs> forgot. I don't know how many of you are aware, if you're aware at all, about the persecuted church around the world. There are many hurting people who are giving their life for the name of Jesus Christ. Some are losing their families, they're losing their husbands, they're losing their wives. Churches are burned, families displaced. It's really bad. And many of us don't even know that that's going on. I don't know if you get emails, if you receive articles in your snail mail from persecution.org or Voice of the Martyrs, several organizations that help bring to light of this, this atrocity around the world for people persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. And you have to understand that it's not just religion that's persecuted, it's those who believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus said that, those who will trust in him have eternal life. But he also said, be ready, because if you believe in me, you will also suffer, even as he suffered. You will be persecuted as he was persecuted. And this morning, we're going to look ahead a little bit into 1 Corinthians. I know Pastor Joe's doing 
part of the series, and I don't want to steal this from him, but he and I talked about doing this um, because it's kind of a missions aspect here, and, and being part of missions, it's, it's important to me, and so uh, he allowed me to present this this morning. So I just would like you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you will. I want to talk about today. Today is the day of remembrance for the persecuted church. And it's very important because in this situation now, we're going to look at the needs of those believers who are, who are firmly standing for Christ despite the cost. They are firmly standing. It's easy to say, oh, yeah, I will always, always say that I'm a Christian. I will always stand up for Christ. Again, it's easy to say, but when someone has a knife at your throat or is burning your house down and threatening that if you don't deny that, that you too will be killed, is it as easy to say and to be a part of? So we'll look at that a little bit this morning, and we'll also investigate what role we have and what we have been given in their plight as brothers and sisters in Christ. There was a young German pastor. His name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Some of you may be familiar with him or not. He died as a young pastor, and he said this, in a Christian community, everything depends upon whether each individual is an indispensable link in a chain. Only when even the smallest link is securely interlocked is the chain unbreakable. Every Christian community must realize that not only do the weak need the strong, but also that the strong cannot exist without the weak. So there's a key concept here to our understanding of what Christ intended for his body to be, the body of Christ. If it's true, and it is, that we are children of God, we are the body of Christ, this is worldwide, then we must understand that within that body, we will each have different roles, and that each part is vitally important in maintaining the functions of the body as a whole. So not just here in Payson, not just Arizona, not just the United States, around the world, those who are believers in Jesus Christ are part of this body called the body of Christ. And each of us has a significant and important role in the body of Christ. We all have differing backgrounds. We all have a different story. We can all sit down and spend hours telling our different stories. And yet, we are all God's children. He has a part for us to play individually, and yet we are designed to function as a body. So individuals that form and function as a body. We are all one unit, and yet each part is equally important to the function of the whole. And I know some people have said, well, we found out that there's parts of the body that you don't need, like the appendix. Right? We can just go in and pull it out anytime we want. But recent research is showing that there are some valuable things to the appendix in helping to fight disease and bacteria. Every part of the body is important. And some would say, well, some are not as important as others. Well, if you're missing any part of your body, you'll know how just important that piece of your body is. Every part is an important function of the body. And as the body of Christ, as Paul presents it, gives us a great picture of all of us functioning together for the whole for the grand picture, for the body to be complete. And so suffering calls us to do something greater than ourselves. Something greater than ourselves. You know, we, I don't know how many of you saw in, in, the, in the internet or heard it on the radio or in the news or drove by this morning and saw the apartment complex behind Ace Hardware that exploded yesterday and burned to the ground. Units from Scottsdale came up to assist and special medical units came to assist. They were saying at first there were some fatalities, but but now they're saying no, but there are some serious injuries. And so those people who are suffering, those who are friends or even not friends of those who lived in the apartment complex are curious and wondering what they can do to help. Who's been in there? Who's been injured? How can I do something? People kind of were in the way a little bit early on because they wanted to see what was going on, and they wanted to know who of their friends or their family members was was involved. And so when we talk about suffering, we think about suffering, we begin to, to talk about something outside of ourselves. What can I do? How is that person? What, how can I help? Is everyone okay? People we don't know, we want to assist. And so when we talk about this picture of the body of Christ, their suffering calls for something greater than just simple 
simply coming from ourselves, simply than just coming and praying and participating in that way. Prayer is important, and that's why we have today to be reminded. Let's, let's look at this man, Richard Rorty. He, he makes this statement also. He says, at times like Auschwitz, when history is in upheaval, we want something that stands beyond history and institutions. What can there be except solidarity, our recognition of one another's common humanity? And we see that in humanity. We see that in catastrophes, and we see that in major trauma events. But when it comes to the body of Christ, it's even more significant because now it's more on the spiritual level than just the physical. Not just the commonality of human life, but the commonality of God life and eternal life and part of the family of God. And you've all done it, okay, right? You've hit your thumb with a hammer or some other object or that fingernail got pulled back and it hurts, right? Pastor Joe will be talking about speaking in tongues, and this is how you learn how, all right? Uh, when your body experiences pain, the other parts immediately react to reduce the pain. We have this joke with my kids when they say, oh, my left arm hurts. I say, well, let me hit the right arm. You'll forget about the left arm. And a lot of times we do that in the body of Christ. We continue to hurt one another in order to cover up one pain or the other, and that's not the proper reaction. Okay? The same should be true for the body of Christ in reducing pain. When one part of the body suffers, the other parts must step up and help reduce the pain. Now, we're not suffering, so we really don't even understand the pain. If you read the articles, if you watch the videos, if you, if you see the pictures, you begin to feel a little bit of the pain, but not really experiencing the pain uh, keeps us from really understanding how to help reduce the pain until we actually go through it. You see, like the picture shows, when you smack your thumb, the pain isn't just in your thumb now. It's, it gives you a headache. Your head hurts. Or... You try to pick up something, and now you can't function because that thumb hurts. And then when the fingernail starts to come off and you hit that little spot in your skin on top where it's really sensitive, some of you are kind of feeling it right now, I know. That smallest little point of pain can produce much anguish to the body. And our brothers and sisters in Christ are suffering, and we're not talking about a simple smash with a hammer on the thumb. We're talking about a major, major suffrage. We're talking about loss of body part here because some believers die. Some believers are executed. We're talking about serious, serious suffering. We may not feel it here, and we really don't. We forget that our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world are suffering this way. I don't know if you're aware, we do have some missionaries in our church who are in different parts of the world who can't give out much testimony of what God is doing for fear that someone may find out who they are or a name that's given that may lead to another person who's been uh, trusted in Christ and now could be executed because of it, which would then come back also upon our, our missionaries who are serving Christ in very dangerous areas. So the suffrage is not also in the physical that way, but the emotional, because I, I know our missionaries would love to give news of great joy. All of the things that God is doing in their lives and in the lives of other people and, and those numbers who are coming to Christ that we don't often hear about and, and we wonder if our money is being put to use because we don't hear and yet they can't because of persecution, because of the attempt on their life and the life of others. Are you having trouble hearing me back there, Blair? Okay, I saw your hand up, so I wanted to make sure if I needed to crank it up, we could do that. All right, all right. So the body is important. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll start with verse 12, look at verse uh, 12 through 26. For even as the body is one and yet has many members and all the members of, uh, of the body, though they are, are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body. Is it not for this reason any less a part of the body? And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body. Is it not for this reason any less a part of the body? And if the whole body were an eye, then where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, 
And where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which are deemed less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, given more abundant honor to that member which lacked so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Very important passage to be reminded of that each part is significant. Each part of the body needs to be cared for. Each part is presented as part of the body before Christ and the world. There's some things that we need to do then. Number one, we need to recognize that Christians in the United States and Christians on the other side of the world are all part of the same body. They may speak a different language. God understands it. We just came back from the Philippines, and and our friends in Cebu City say that God speaks Cebuano. That's the language of heaven, they claim, okay? That's what they grew up in. That's what they understand God to understand them in, and God does understand them. God knows the thoughts, the intents of the heart. God understands every language of the world. He gave the languages. But we're all one body, and despite language or uh, place on the planet, those who trust in Christ are all part of the same body. God created us to be in- intricately related to one another in a way that we cannot fully understand. Now, this revelation is not by blood, but it is, or sorry, this relation is not by blood, but it is by some force stronger than that. But at the same time, the Spirit of God, and in a sense, it is by the blood of Christ. So not physical, but it is physical because blood is physical, but by the blood of Christ, it's spiritual. We have the Spirit of God that unites us and brings us all together as one body in Christ. Second of all, we can recognize that each part of the body is important. We're important here. They're important there. All of us are important together as one universal body. Each part plays a role that's significant in the family of God. And we need to be cautious when how, how we either think about or don't think about the other parts of the body that we don't see or feel. When a person loses one of his or her senses the other four senses become stronger to make up for the the lack of the one. Now, that doesn't give us an excuse to say, well, where I have lack, God will give them more abundant ability because it's like the body. Well, yes, it's true that happens, but that's not a reason for us to not participate or cooperate in the body of Christ. In the same way, we as the body of Christ should be doing the same thing for other members of the body. We take care of ourselves. We take care of the other members. Take care of this hand, you take care of this hand also. You take care of this leg, you take care of this leg also. We have to do the same for the entire body of Christ. If there is a part of the body that is suffering for some reason, the stronger part of the body should help at the suffering part. Now, I know I'm I'm younger than many of you, but I've had shoulder surgery already. I've had tendonitis problems, and when this hand won't pick up a glass of water because the tendonitis is so bad, this hand has to help with it. And that's the way the stronger helps with the weaker. We don't just cut it off and say, well, it's no good to me anymore. We use it and we uh, strengthen it with the help of the other parts. So these suffering members are no less important. Those who suffer for Christ are probably of more significance and more importance in the whole purpose and plan of God. It is much truer that the members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary. They are necessary. It's important because I don't know if you've noticed, when the church is persecuted, Christians get with it. It's when we're not persecuted, we become lackadaisical, and we forget where we came from. 
you go back in the history of the Old Testament, when Israel was constantly in battles and they became persecuted by the enemy, they would turn back to God. And so for us as Christians, those who are part of the body of Christ, when we have suffrage, we turn back to God and look for help. Like physically, we go to the doctor. Spiritually, as a body of Christ, we go to the Father and we ask for help and we aid one another. But in the process, we grow and we strengthen just as we do under persecution. Unfortunately, I think in our country, we're going to have to undergo some serious persecution before we have a revival. We can talk revival all we want, but I don't think that we really understand yet because we haven't gone through the persecution to realize that the need for this revival. So we have people who are doing missions in their own land who are suffering, but they're no less important than those of us Christians who are here. They also have a testimony of faith. We have this testimony of faith. They shine as a light, and we are to shine as a light. And what we find is that these Christians who are suffering get more attention. Jesus Christ is made more manifest in their lives. Jesus Christ is seen through their testimony, and they are shining a light. Even when the world is trying to suppress it, the light shines. For us here who are not undergoing the persecution, I'm not sure our light is as bright. I'm not sure that our testimony of faith is as great because we are not undergoing the same pressures and persecution of our brothers and sisters around the world. And third, we must care for those believers that are suffering in ways that we are not. I don't know about you, but I see these pictures and I, I just cringe. And I, I wonder, how are these people coping with some of these things? I have hit my thumb and I hurt, but seeing a, a woman with this gash in her neck from a machete or a woman pictures, uh, pictured holding her child that has been killed by people who came in or a woman laying her husband to rest who is a pastor of a church and her family and children standing around her, uh, that's hard for me to look at. By just not looking at it doesn't solve the problem. How do we help them? How do we pray for them? How do we encourage them at this distant land? And what can we do? So we must care for these believers. And just as different part of the physical body suffer in different ways, so it is with the body of Christ. They're suffering. My ignorance of it or my desire to turn away from it doesn't mean the suffering isn't there. I don't know if you guys have probably tried to avoid pain. You know, you, you have a pain in your body. You say, well, I'm just not going to think about it. Do something else. I'll forget about it. The reality is the pain is still there. The reason is still there. The cause, something has to be done. When one member suffers, we all suffer. But we must also understand that as part of the body, we will suffer when the body suffers. We will also rejoice when the body rejoices. So at the same time, we receive pictures and, and bad news. We also see pictures and hear of good news. While a pastor may have lost his life because he stood up for Christ, maybe a, a member or a family member or a brother, sister, or an uncle or aunt came to Christ because of it. Why is this person so willing to give their life for this Jesus and they become curious. And so while it seems like a loss to us, we rejoice at the same time because others come to Christ through it. And the testimony and the example spreads throughout the world, and we see that we too can do it. When the body suffers, it also can grow, and it can be strengthened. And so we watch, and we're strengthened by it when we see what the rest of the body does, and we rejoice. Again, many believers are suffering greatly. They're really struggling, and they're having some difficult times, and we must not ignore or forget about these brethren. They are members of the body of Christ, and we are to suffer with them, and we do suffer. The church as a whole suffers with these believers. And so in the same way that we would take care of the physical ailments in our lives, we must also take care of our Christian body as well. How do we do that? Well, there's some things that we can do. First of all, we need to defend them. We need to defend our brothers and sisters. The suffering church needs us to speak on their behalf. There's a lot of things that we speak about, which are great. We speak about abortion, right? And we, we speak against it, and we talk about how you know, we want to preserve that life. We should just as strongly be preserving the life and body of Christ, and we need to be spokespersons on their behalf. These men and women and children are in many ways helpless to change their situation. In fact, you have those who are persecuted in North Korea. They are fleeing into parts of China and other areas. 
and they're being deported and sent back. And when they're sent back, they are persecuted because they left because of religious reasons. And so uh, it's really some situation that they cannot change. And they can't just simply deny Christ because they know that who their Savior is, and they're not going to deny Christ. So they live in fear, and we need to speak up for them and to defend them. We have an opportunity to speak for them, to make a voice, and make their suffering known to all. We can do that. I'll talk about that this morning. Proverbs says in verse, uh, chapter 31, verse 9, Open your mouths, judge righteously, and defend the rights of the afflicted and needy. Okay? Some wisdom from the book of Proverbs. It's easy to just sit there and look at pictures or to watch, but we need to open our mouth and to defend the best that we can. We can also encourage. How do we encourage some of these folks? Like our brothers and sisters who live nearby, the persecuted also need encouragement. So we send letters to people close at home, get well soon cards, flowers, haven't seen you in a while, these things. Those can also be done to our brothers and sisters who need that encouragement. Paul reminds the church to encourage one another and build one another up, all the more so as you see the day approaching. How can we encourage them? You know, we don't understand the persecution. How do you just pat someone on the back and say, oh, it'll be okay? We sing this song this morning, Come Thou Found of Every Blessing. You know, how do these people sing these songs? Do they rejoice when they sing these songs? Are these songs difficult as they suffer persecution? And yet, they continue to be a part of the body. And so we need to support them. We need the community of Christ, all of us do. How much more do these believers who worship God under threat of punishment need that sustaining love of community. They need to know that, that we have their back, that we support them, and that we care for them. And then many imprisoned believers have testified that they have received great encouragement in letters from fellow believers. Some people don't write letters or send cards because they think, well, it'll never get there. You know what? It may or may not. But the responsibility that we have to encourage is still there, so we do what we can, and we allow God to send the cards the best way that he knows how to those people to encourage them. God will get that encouragement to them. And then we can pray. Today, the National Day of Prayer, International Day of Prayer for the persecuted church. Prayer is vital. It's not just words that come off our lips and fall to the floor or hit the ceiling. The Bible tells us all we need to participate, and it says we are told in Scripture that the prayers of the righteous avail much. That's kind of a shortened version, but the reality is they do work. Prayers are heard by God, and they do something. Our persecuted brethren need continual prayer. We need to talk to God about our body. We need to go to the doctor, God, and tell him about our body and pray for those who are afflicted. We need to make sure they're being lifted up to God daily in prayer, not just an annual event. Daily, we need to pray for the persecuted. In your bulletin this morning, you should have a flyer. It's in color of different places around the world where there is severe persecution going on. If you didn't get a bulletin, I encourage you to pick one up. Take one of the flyers. Pray daily for those in these persecuted areas. There's also the website that you can go to, and you can see current videos or current standings or situations going on where we have brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering greatly around the world. And then... Finally, it says, let us not forget to pray without ceasing for those brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray without ceasing. When we accept the grace of Christ, we are welcomed into a great narrative community of believers. We're all part of that body, and it's important for us, and it's essential that we care for the body. We must remember that we are no longer only held responsible for ourselves, but what we have done for the little, the lost, the lonely, for what we have done for the persecuted. We will be remembered for that as well. So consider what you can do as part of the body to help others and are in greater pain and distress than yourself. We are all members of the body, all members of the body of Christ. Which part are you? Some are more active. Some seem to be more functional. Some seem to be more strengthened. Are you weak? Are you strong? Regardless, you're part of the body how can you participate? A final verse here from Proverbs 24, verse 11 and 12. Deliver those who are being taken away to death and those who are staggering to slaughter. Oh, hold them back 
If you say, see, we did not know this, does, does he not consider it who weighs the hearts? And does he not know it who keeps your soul? And will he not render to man according to his work? We have this time in history now when we can visually see the persecuted church. In history past, we have not been able to be aware of these events going on with brothers and sisters in Christ until years later when a book is written about a missionary journey or some of the suffering that has gone on. Now it's a daily thing, and we can see it in the media. We can read about it, and it's all around us. We can do something about it. I'm reminded of a song in the contemporary world from a Christian artists that, that I enjoy listening to. It says, if we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing, and why aren't his words teaching? And if we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing them there is a way? And I would think not only for the unbeliever, but for the persecuted Christian who's part of our body, as part of the body, are we reaching out to care for the other parts? Uh, I'm going to ask Pastor Joe to come up now. We are a body, and we remember not just this body of Christ, that we are part of, but also the physical body of Christ. And now is our time when we come to communion to be reminded of his body that reached out for us. You know, when Christians suffer, the world seems to say, what kind of God is this that you worship that would allow this? They forget It's allowed because we live in a sinful world. The difference is that God has a way out of it. And that's what this table is all about. Because it was the suffering of Jesus that made it possible for us to become eternal children of God and someday to uh, reach heaven. And there is great reward for those who are martyrs. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took of the bread and he took of the cup. It was for those disciples a whole different symbolism because to them it was a picture of coming out of Egypt, coming out of that bondage. But Jesus said now it's a a picture of a different spiritual bondage, your bondage to sin. And this is going to be my body that will be hanging on that tree. It is my blood that will be shed for you. So, gentlemen, will you come now to serve us? And let's pray together and pray that God might burden our hearts with those who are a part of this communion all over the world, part of us. And that this blood that was shed for them might cause that message to get out even more because this is the blood that makes the difference. Father, thank you for sending your son. Lord, for those who complain about the pain and the suffering and blame you for it, it's all because of sin. But you have a way around the sin that causes us such suffering. But only one way and that is through your son. Uh, Only one sacrifice. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't do it. My own blood couldn't save me for eternity, but the blood of the sinless, spotless Lamb of God could do that, and I thank you, Father, for sending your son. And now may you use this time as we commune together to cause us to remember what you've done to take us out of eternal suffering, Lead us into that place that you've prepared for us that eye has not seen nor ear has heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men what you've prepared for those who love you. Thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Now, men, if you'll serve us, please.
Jesus said to his disciples, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together.